Okay, we're back with lesson number six, I think this is. And we're still looking at, sorry, I got the wrong penguin in there. Still looking at these two penguins in there. We're trying to get this one to look like that. So let's just continue on. Last time we left off, we were trimming up under the strap of the bow tie. And now we're going to trim the top of that. So we're going to just take a knife and we're going to go around and make a V cut. Or not a V cut, a stop cut. Right there in that groove at the top of the bow tie strap. So just follow that all the way around. And then we'll just start removing wood all along that line. Stop cut allows you to be able to tell the knife when it stops. And you hear that snapping noise. That is the familiar sound of your, your knife reaching the bottom of that stop cut. That little click noise or snap noise, whatever you want to call it, lets you know that you've reached that area of that stop cut and then you can just take it off. I like that snapping noise. I don't know about you, but it lets me know that I made a good stop cut and I'm where I need to be. We'll spend just a minute or two and trim around the head, making sure that we've removed all those annoying saw cuts that everybody has on their carving. But if you're like me, you don't like them because they remind you that if you don't get them off of there, when you go to paint or stain, those things show up like blaring road signs. They make the awfulest look on your paint and on your stain. Doesn't look very finished, and especially if you're going to do a competition, one of the things that a judge wants to see is finished work. Now, there's a difference between primitive and rough and finished, but if you're doing something like this, especially if it's for a customer, or for a competition, or even just for your own personal pride, you want to show that off. Get those saw marks off of there. Get those saw marks and split marks. Spend a few minutes going around your carving, making sure you've taken care of all these little annoying little things like this, where you see these little pieces sticking out right there. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me when I see carvers at a professional level or carvers at a high level leaving things like that it drives me nuts because I think it sets a bad example for those coming along behind you who want to do what you're doing they really enjoy your carvings and if you're doing that you're showing them that the carving wasn't worth putting that little extra effort into it so just my one of my personal peeves I'll try not to get on my soapbox the more videos I get although I'm sure I'll have a few more and this year of 2017 there seemed to be a a lot of well, 2018 now, but last year, 2017, there seemed to be quite a number of pet peeves that everybody wanted to talk about and get on their soapbox. I try not to do that too much, so you don't want to hear that. That's not why you tuned in here. You tuned in to see me carve and to carve along with me, so hopefully you're having a little bit of fun. Let's trim those feet a little bit, because again, I got saw marks and I got straight edges, and I don't know of any penguin or any very many animals that have straight lines on them, so we're just going to trim those up to a rough shape of not square. Whatever shape that is, not square, we just don't want it to be that way. And so I'm just going to go around the feet, remove these saw marks, remove my drawn marks, remove the sharp edges, and get it ready so that when we do get ready to do those feet, we don't have those annoying reminders in the way to tell us that, hey, you're not finished with me. Come back here and clean your mess up. Take care of your paperwork. Take care of your little stuff. Again, we'll do this on the other side, make it a little bit rounded. Take off those saw marks, take off those straight edges, flat edges, and get this thing looking pretty. I haven't talked a whole lot about the, the various cuts that you need. I'm assuming you know how to do a stop cut. I'm assuming you know how to do a Pairing cut, thumb cut, push cut, whatever the names may be. I'm assuming you know that. I may do a video sometime later showing you how to do those. But if you're tuning in at this point, 
you've watched me enough, you've watched other people enough, you know how these cuts go. So I won't spend a lot of time going all the way back to basic. There's a lot of videos out there that have done that, showing you how to do that. I don't want to recreate their work. I don't want to step on their toes. I just want to do carving projects for people who want to carve. Come along with us. We'll have a little bit of fun, tell some jokes. If you want to send me a personal message, you can reach me again. Eric Owens Art .blogspot .com. Find me on Facebook, John Eric Owens. We'll have a good conversation. We'll show each other what we've been doing. We'll have a good time on this journey we call carving. I want to trim this bow tie strap up. This is probably the best tool I got for doing that for at this point. It's going to thin it down because it's not going to stick out very far. And in fact, depending on how blubbery your penguin is, uh, it may in fact be indented below the body surface because that's at a crucial point where for most men, I assume for all men, we wear a bow tie around our neck. So usually that neck is the transition point between the body and the head and sometimes that strap gets lost in between the fat of our neck and the fat of our head depending on how much of a fat head we are. It's one of the reasons I don't wear bow ties. <laughs> I don't wear many ties. Uh, I have to wear them a few times a year as a school teacher but I don't usually wear that many ties because I'm an old country boy and they just don't fit well with me. If they let me wear overalls, blue jeans, flannel shirts to school, I'd probably do that. But anyway, so we're just continuing to take off some of this wood that we don't want where it's at. Here I got a knife cut that I don't want, or a saw cut that I don't want. So I'm just going to take a more flexible knife so that I can round that. If you don't know how to do that, grab yourself a flexible knife and go with a big knife and try to carve in and turn at the same time. In other words, you're making a rounded cut with a straight split, straight edge. That's hard to do on a thick one because there's very little flexibility on these. I love these knives. These are made by Dell Stubbs at Pinewood Forge. I call him up there and he'll make you a knife. These are some of the best knives that I've ever used. But they're good for hogging out and heavy duty stuff. And then the tip is good for detail stuff. But when you've got to get in here to a tight spot and you want to get rid of that saw cut, got to have something that'll flex and bend because otherwise you're going to fight yourself going in and fight yourself coming out. So this allows me to get right in there and bend, curve the knife, and take that piece of wood out that I didn't want. I'll do the same thing over here, not quite as deep, but it allows me to have flexibility when I'm using that blade. So if you don't have one of those thin narrow blades, I'm not saying you got to run out and get one. I'm not a big one for advocating you go out and buy a bunch of tools. Because usually, a friend of mine and I were talking at lunch yesterday and he was telling me a couple of tools he wanted to buy for this specific thing and this specific thing. And, and my recommendation to most people is don't buy a lot of tools for a specific spot. Learn to see what your tools can and can't do. And then if you find out that you just can't do a particular job with a particular tool, then maybe it's time to, to splurge a little bit on that. But um, I'm not trying to take food out of the tool maker's mouths and family but simply said uh, you can get by doing a lot of things with the tools in your hand with just a little more experience so if you don't have that experience seek out somebody who does seek out somebody in your group who's won blue ribbons or who has done it for a long time or who has taught or does work that you admire and they'll be glad to sit down and teach you so there's not a single carver that i know of that has not answered every question i've ever had when i was learning how to carve. They've always gone out of their way to help me. In fact, some of them said, here's a tool I never use anymore. You can have this one or I'll sell it to you or whatever. Specific tool that I may not have had. And I've got, I've gotten several tools along the way that way. But that's been able to help me a lot because somebody sat me down and said, nope, here's the tool you've got already in your inventory. Do this with it and it'll work perfectly. So, all right, we've got almost everything roughed in that we want. We're going to go back and clean up some stuff. You'll see that there's still some wood under here I don't really want. But we're going to work on the feet and we're going to work on the beak. So one of the things I don't like to do on the beak, especially if it's real thin or narrow, is to work on that to start with. Because as you're moving around, you're gripping this thing in a lot of different ways. And sometimes an accidental grip and a push, and you'll break something off that's fragile. It happens on fingers, it happens on hat brims, it happens on a lot of things. On this one, I think it's thick enough to where we don't have to worry about it, because even back over here where it's going to be thinner, 
uh, it's still going to be tr um, strong enough to where we're going to be able to not have to worry about gripping it. Anyway, what I want to do is take this flexible knife and I just want to come along and start to take off that wood. And that's not going to work that way, so we'll reverse it. So we're just going to take off that wood along where I have it. And one of the things I should have done is outline that because I'll carve those lines off and I'll wonder where they went and I'll wonder where they go if I don't know what I'm doing. Now I've done several of these penguins so I, I have a good idea of where it's going to go. But anyway, I'm going to remove that and I can just go in now. Be careful, don't push in too deep, it'll go all the way through. And I'll just take a little bit off at a time. And we'll get that thing going where it needs to go in the direction we want it to go. So it doesn't take much. Push very carefully. And if you don't like pushing that way, you have a little more control this way with your thumb. I can go in that way. The problem is if I go in too aggressively, I'm going to cut into this nose, into that beak. So I want to make sure I don't have a lot of a lot of cuts in that area. If I go in there really hard, I'll end up with some cuts under here that I've got to uh, take care of, and then I've got a lot of that's got to be removed. So I don't want to do that too aggressively, but I don't want to be too timid. I don't want to spend 30 minutes sitting here making seven cuts. I want to get them, and I want to get after them, and I want to get them done. Get in, get after it, get it done, as I like to tell my students. So that's what we're trying to teach carving along the way. Let's get in, get after it, know where we're going to go, and get where we get where we want to go. Okay. So we got that beak roughly roughed in, and know that it's going to come to a point out here. Let me pull the other one in here. It's going to come to a point. It's going to be angled on both sides and angled on the bottom. So if I pull that point somewhere right in here, and more than likely right there is where that beak point is going to be. If I mark that, then I pretty much know that that's where it's going to be. And I'm not going to worry about having a mouth drawn in or anything like that. I just want to know where that's going to go. Okay, so we'll move him out of the side. Get some of these tools out of the way. I'm going to go back to the flexible knife that I have. This is one of my favorite knives, although I don't use it as much as I um, used to, simply because I find that as flexible as it is, as much as I've had it resharpened, reground, rehoned, um, it's starting to get a little bit of thin. Anyway, I'm going to take that flexible knife and I'm going to go in there and see how it flexes and then turns. It allows me the opportunity to gouge out and make a good place for cheeks and eyeballs. Do the same thing over here. We're just going to shape that up so that we've gotten rid of that cut that I had in there, which those things can be kind of annoying in your way. Get them out of the way as soon as you can, because otherwise they just serve to distract your, vi your vision. And then what I want to do is I want to trim that area down to the bow tie. I would love for him to have big rounded cheeks. I don't know that I have enough wood there, but maybe we can fake it. So I'm going to go back to my V-tool, and I'm just going to outline that to the bottom of the nose, bottom of the beak. It serves to outline that cheek, and also serves to outline the top of the bow tie. Now we know exactly where the top and the bottom of that bow tie is. So I can go in here with a stop cut, and I can just trim down. I want to trim off the bottom to see if I can make a chubby cheek. I'm not sure I got it, but you know, we may be able to remove some more wood along the way and make his cheek kind of chubby that way. I'll take out a thin piece down here. Keep that going down there. When we flip it over, kind of looks like he's got a chubby cheek over there that we can work with, especially if we trim out. Maybe I'm making him too human by having puffy cheeks or whatever. What do they call it? Anthropomorphizing, where you're putting human tendencies onto an animal. But you know what? As they say, this is caricature carving. It's my happy little world. And we don't make mistakes. As Bob Ross says, we make happy little accidents. So we're going to make sure that these little accidents work out the way we want. Do the same thing over here. I'll just trim out that cheek and try to make it puff out so that I can then go back round and shape that head a little bit more that we've got 
some chubby cheeks on this fella. Obviously we've got some work to do. We've got some cutting in here to do and cutting down in here. But we've got an idea of where we want to go. I'm going to trim these cut marks off of this bow tie again. If you haven't got the idea now that I don't like cut marks on my carving when I'm working, you'll learn soon enough. I just like to get them off as soon as I can. It helps me know exactly what's... I know the wood underneath that has got to be removed. So once I get off all those saw marks, then I know what I have left to work with. And that way I can then see where I need to make changes because every wood seems to be different. I can cut 10 patterns out of the same pattern that I've got. I can cut 10 blanks out of there and it seems like every one of them is a little bit different because my hand moved on the saw or a number of things. Anyway, when I do that, that gives me room to know where things are going to come off. Okay. So we're getting this little guy closer to being where we want him to go. I think a fun part will be when we get to get to painting. Hopefully we'll have time to getting them done and painting them. Okay. So I'm going to remove some of this excess wood in here that I don't want because I've got to leave room and a space in here for those flippers. So I'm going to go back to a, a little stiffer knife. I just want to make a stop cut right along the bottom of that strap all the way up to that bow tie. And I'm just going to make a stop cut right in there so that I can take out that wood chip right there and trim that body to match because of what I had was a discrepancy between here and here. So now I've been able to negotiate that discrepancy and make it a little bit more smooth so that I can put some flappers in here. We'll do the same thing over here although we've pretty much done that with our v with our fishtail gouge a minute ago. And we've got him where we need to go. A little bit of clean up right there. And that looks a little better. All right. Take my pencil. And knowing when we draw lines, sometimes I'll draw front and back center lines, side and side center lines. I didn't do that on this one. But if I look at the center line on this body, it's roughly about right there. So that's a little bit forward of that. And a little bit back. There's a flipper. May not show up very well using a pencil. But you get the idea. I'm going to do the same thing over here. I have a center line coming right down here in the middle. 